First John chapter five, um, chapter two, verse two. If you don't have a Bible, you should be one in the uh, back of the cube right there in front of you. John writes in First John one verse five. This is the message we have heard from him. That's from the Lord, and we declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is an atonement sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you know all about us, and you love us with an everlasting love, an unconditional love. And you demonstrate that love by sending your son to the cross of Calvary where he bore on his body our sins. And Father, thank you that you pursue us and you want a relationship with each one of us. And so, Father, I pray that we have that relationship. But if there are those outside of Christ, I pray that today they understand their need for Jesus and they open their heart and their life to him. And Lord, for those who know Jesus, help us to search our hearts and see if there's any sin in our lives and bring that before you and seek your forgiveness and restoration. Lord, we love you. I pray that you bless the children in the nursery and those working with them, those in children's church. Thank you for all those that serve. Lord, have your perfect will and way in each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Rather than brash, young man once came to the pastor and said, you stated that unsaved people carry a weight of sin. The boy said, I feel nothing. How heavy is sin? The pastor said, 10 pounds? 80 pounds? A hundred pounds. And the preacher responded with a question of his own, which is a tactic that Jesus often employed with those who opposed him. Jesus often, when people asked him a question, he turned around and asked the questioner a question. And the pastor asked the boy, he said, let me ask you, if you laid a 400 pound weight upon a horse, would it feel the load? And the boy replied, it wouldn't feel anything because it's dead. So it is with the soul that's spiritually dead, the pastor replied. It too feels no heavy load of sin, because such a person is indifferent to sin and uncaring about the presence of sin in her life, because he or she is spiritually dead. I love the following quote from author and speaker J.I. Packer. He said, No one can see sin, what sin is till he has learned what or who God is. You can't really appreciate sin and what it is until you really come to know who God is. So far in this study of the letter of 1 John, we want to be great lengths to point out this. A person can be extremely devout, uh, religious, very devout, and yet not possess eternal life. There are a lot of people out there that are depending upon their church attendance, their good works, or their baptism to gain them eternal life. We've learned that good works or any effort on our own will never provide salvation. Instead, the only way that a person can receive eternal life is by confessing our sin, by expressing godly sorrow over that sin, and by turning to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin and salvation. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except for me. We also reference John 17, 3, which is really Jesus' prayer. We call the disciples' prayer, our Father art in heaven. That's really the disciples' prayer. The Lord's real prayer is in John 17. That's Jesus praying, sharing his heart with his Father. And he said, I pray that they might have eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So knowing Jesus Christ is what salvation is all about on a personal basis. Just as there are vital signs that there's an indication of spiritual life, 
some of those vital signs and things like blood pressure and pulse and heart rate and oxygen and, and brain waves. Those tell us whether a person actually has life. There are also vital signs that give us evidence that we have spiritual or eternal life. And last week we took a, a look at the first of those spiritual vital signs. That was fellowship with God the Father and fellowship with His Son Jesus Christ and fellowship with others in the body of Christ. In other words, we said the true Christian enjoys a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That person knows God as his or her Heavenly Father and Jesus as his or her Savior. They don't just know about God, but they know Him personally. And they also enjoy fellowship or point of view or sharing with other believers in Christ. This morning we're taking a look at the second vital sign that gives evidence and gives uh, proof of our salvation. And it says, every true believer in Jesus Christ has a deep awareness of his or her own personal sin. When true conversion, salvation, regeneration, the new birth actually occurs, the sinner feels the heavy burden of sin pressing upon his convicted heart. And understanding it, as Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, understanding that he or she is spiritually bankrupt and in of themselves they have nothing to present before God, this person no longer tries to cover his sin or her sin, but instead openly confesses God, yes, I am a sinner. And the heart convicted of sin now chooses to confess it eagerly before the Lord, trusting completely in Christ's finished work and saying about Jesus paid it all. Trusting in Jesus and what he did on the cross for our forgiveness and for salvation. Now, whenever God performs a true work of a saving grace, listen, it is always accompanied by a deep awareness of one's own sin. Without the conscious awareness of one's sin, there's no perceived need for forgiveness. If we don't understand that we're sinners, then we think, what do I need to be forgiven from? When we come to the realization of our sin and the effects on our life, we say, what effect does sin have on our life? Sin has this effect. The wages of sin is death. We're spiritually dead. And it says in Isaiah 59 that our sin has separated us from God. Only when we understand why we're sinners and the effect, the ramification, the consequences for our sin, only then do we sense, I need that my sin forgiven. And I need God's amazing grace and mercy. Only as we humbly and willingly confess our sins over and over can we have the assurance of our salvation. Listen, if you're a child of God, then you should be aware of sin in life. And that awareness should be followed by a willingness to confess that sin to the Lord and to express godly sorrow and the desire for God to forgive you of that sin. People that are spiritually dead Feel no need of it, feel no real conviction until and unless the Holy Spirit begins to work in their life. The Apostle John begins this section of his letter, verse 1, by declaring the absolute holiness of God. And until, until we see the perfection of God, there will be no awareness of our own sin. Just as light is pure, light is undefiled and without any darkness, so God Himself is absolutely pure. He's morally perfect. He is void of any imperfections. And what is the result of that? God's holy character is the universal standard by which He judges each one of us. Twice in the Bible, Leviticus 19.2 in the Old Testament, and 1 Peter 1.15 in the New Testament, God demands, be holy, even as I, the Lord, am holy. Jesus said essentially the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.48 where He said this, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But here's the simple truth. When we measure ourselves against God's perfection, we fall woefully short. The way that the Bible says in Romans 3, 20, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to be completely honest with one another. There's not one, there's not one exception where we can say, I am the exception, I've never sinned. I don't have a sin problem. Because it says in Romans 3, there's none righteous. Not even one. Sin 
creates the chasm between sinful man and the holy God. On the one side over here is sinful man. On the other side is the holy God, and in between is this chasm, this gap. What happens when you hold something up to bright light, or you have the sun shining in your window, and you say, wow, my window is dirty. Or you put clothing up to, uh, and you say, I thought that was stained or something, and you hold it up and go, wow, look at the dirt in it. Likewise, the closer we view our own lives in light of God's holiness, the more we see our own unholiness, the more we see the dirt or the stain of our own sin. That was the experience of the prophet Isaiah. Keep your finger there in first John, but turn almost to the middle of your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and verses 1 to 8. And Isaiah is writing, and he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He had a vision of the Lord. He said, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. He was high and exalted, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs, or seraphim, or angels. And each of these angels had six wings. And with two of the wings, they covered their face. With two more, they covered their feet. And with the remaining two, they were flying. And look at verse 3. You listen to verse 3. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then notice Isaiah's response in verse 5. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined because I recognize I am a man of unclean lips, and I live upon a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of those seraphs, flew to me with a live pool in his hand, which he had taken the throne from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the first voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. Following the death of King Uzziah, Isaiah was able to see God in vision. He was the throne, God was in the heavens. Majestic and ruling over all. Notice what the angelic being, the beings, the seraphim, were crying out to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The foundations of the temple began to shake and Isaiah's heart began to pound rapidly. Smoke engulfed the temple, symbolizing God's Shekinah glory. And as Isaiah the prophet got just a small glimpse of God's incredible glory. The prophet was totally humble. He was undone. He said, woe is me. I realize I've seen God in all his glory and look at me. I'm a mess. I'm not okay. He understood he was sinful and deserving of God's judgment against his sin. That same thing should hold true for each one of us. When you and I become aware of how holy God is, we get uh, just a small appreciation of His splendor and His glory. We recognize just how far short we have fallen and how desperately we need God's mercy and His grace. I love the words of the third stanza of the hymn, Grace is Greater Than All Our Sin. It says, as dark as the stain, we cannot hide. You can try to hide it, but you can't because our sin is so dark. What can avail to wash it away? How do I get rid of this dark stain of sin in my life? And the answer is, look, there's flowing in crimson time. The blood of Jesus Christ. Whiter than snow you can be today. If you can walk in here dirty with your sin, stained by sin, but the blood of Jesus Christ can make you white, clean. Peter had a similar experience. Tom doesn't permit us to look at Luke chapter 5, but Peter was fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And keep in mind, he was a veteran fisherman. He'd been out fishing all night and Jesus appears to him. And guess what he caught? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And yet Jesus said uh, to the proud fisherman, hey, give it another try. Put your net back into the sea. And Peter was probably thinking to himself, okay, Jesus. Now listen, I'm the expert fisherman. I do this for a living. And I haven't caught anything all night. But I'll tell you, Jesus, I'll humor you. I'll throw my net into the sea, you know. I can already tell you what's going to happen. Nothing. Because I've been at it all night. Fish aren't biting. 
But when Peter complied with Christ's orders, an amazing thing happened. The Bible says that he caught so many fish that that began to break. And he had to summon his partner in the fishing business to bring a second boat. And both boats were so full of fish that they began to sink. And then Peter, when he saw this tremendous display of God's power and God's glory, Peter fell down at, his, at the feet of Jesus and said, Lord, depart from me because I'm a simple man. Like Isaiah, Peter became aware of his own unworthiness when he was faced with Christ's holiness, Christ's power, Christ's glory. Same thing was true of the Old Testament character Job. Catastrophe after catastrophe happened to Job. He lost his family, his children. He lost his possessions. He was a wealthy man. He lost all that. He lost his health. And he's crying out to God saying, God, I'm trying to figure out why this has happened to me. I can't see any sin in my life, specific sin, something that I've done that you could discipline me this way. And he's having this ongoing conversation with God, and God lets us go for a while. God will let us bend for a while. God will let us ask questions for a while. God may or may not explain to us. Listen, he's your creator. God made that clear to Job in Job 38. He said, Job, I've listened to you long enough. He said, now, curve yourself up like a man and listen to me and answer these questions for me. And he began by saying, Job, uh, where were you when I hung the stars in space? And he went on and asked 70 questions of Job. And basically he was saying, listen, Job, I am the creator. You are the created being. You are the created one. Stop questioning me. I am sovereign. And Job's response in Job 42, 5 and 6 was like, I've heard of you, God, but now that you've asked these questions, and then I see who you are, and you know what? He said, I abhor myself. I despise myself, and I repent in ashes and sackcloth. When he got a real appreciation of who God was, Job was totally undone. It'll be the same with you and me whenever we get even a small glimpse and appreciation of who God is, how holy He is. We will become painfully aware of the awfulness of our own sin. There won't be any smugness on our part, just brokenness and humility. You cannot begin to see God's holiness without then recognizing your own sinfulness. Now, if someone claims to be a Christian, and if you're one of them and you say, I'm a Christian, but you don't deal with sin, John is questioning the salvation of such an individual. Look at verse 6. He declares that such a person who refuses to deal with his sin really has no fellowship. He's not sharing with God. Those who say they uh, have fellowship with God are those who claim to be Christians. They verbally confess Christ. Their mouth say, I know Christ. They profess to know. But if their lives, let's be living, persistent disobedience and darkness. Persistent is the key word. If they live in this ongoing disobedience and unconfessed sin, John insists that they're actually demonstrating by their life that they're still spiritually lost. Their profession of faith is playing out as a sham or a hollow profession. Because such an individual is in darkness, they don't see the sin in their own life. They don't realize their lost condition. Satan does his utmost to keep us from seeing the truth about our sin and its consequences. He's called the angel of light. He masquerades around as an angel of light, trying to keep people's eyes blinded from seeing the truth. And if we don't walk in the light of God's holiness, it's a sign that you and I need to question the validity of our profession of faith. Listen, listen carefully. If your walk doesn't match your talk, it seems as if your profession is a lie. No matter how much a person may insist, I know Christ, if that person remains virtually unchanged and persists in walking in sin, that person is separated from God and oblivious to his lost spiritual condition. He's talking to uh, the pastor of this church here, and he was talking about his life. He said, I used to be like that. I said, you used to. He said, yeah, B.C., before Christ. I was like that. But I'm different once I've come to Christ. Look on now at 1 John 1, 7. By contrast, the one who is truly saved gives evidence of their salvation by walking in the light. 
Because of the keen awareness of his own sin, this individual has appropriated God's grace and mercy as a means of their salvation. It is the knowledge of sin that drives us to Christ for cleansing. Only when we see ourselves as sinners deserving of an eternity apart from God, only then when we seek the need, sense the need to humble ourselves and place our faith in Jesus alone. The end of verse 7, I love the end of verse 7. It says this, the blood of Christ cleanses us, purifies us. Don't look at me. Look at the verse unless you have it memorized. The blood of Christ cleanses us from how much sin? All sin. Not a lot of sin, not most sin, not some sin, all sin, past sin, present sin, future sin. What a great thing that is. And walking in the light, in 1 John 1, 7, refers to a consistent lifestyle and personal holiness. It's an ongoing process. Listen, we are a work in progress. It's an ongoing thing all our life long. I'm in no way suggesting to you that once a person is saved, that that individual struggle with sin is over because they've somehow reached this level of sinless perfection. But, John says, as one continues to walk in the light of God, his truth and his ways, the deeds of darkness are exposed to that individual and confession of sin will be made. It's only as we walk in God's light that we're able to detect the sin and dirt in our own lives and stain in our lives. And once we see that as Christians, there should be this eagerness to humbly confess and seek the cleansing from that sin. Not to get saved again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't say again and again and again. And if Jesus saves you, keep this in mind. He saved you. He keeps you saved. You don't keep yourself saved. He keeps you saved. And so once we see that we're saved and the Holy Spirit's living in us, He's going to point out the sin and we should say, I want to be dealing with that. And that should be occurring on a daily basis. Now, here's the sad reality. There are a lot of people who claim to be Christians who have never forsaken their sin. They're still living the exact same way before that profession. They're continuing on their sinful way of living as if nothing is wrong and nothing has changed in the least bit. They still use the same profane language. They're still watching the same thing. They're still hanging out with the same people. They're still doing all the things they did prior to their supposed confession of faith in Christ. They want to come off as Christians, but they don't want to owe up to any sin in their lives. Now look at verse 8. Claiming they have no sin in their lives, they remain blind to the fact that sin still exists in their daily walk. And although the Bible makes it clear that every single person, even though they're Christians, they still sin, these people say, sin? In my life? What could you possibly be talking about? I don't have any of that in my life. Even though the true Christian comes to Christ and receives a total, complete, immediate cleansing, the true Christian understands the old nature is still battling the new nature. It's still ongoing. The, the old man is battling the new man. And Paul, the apostle, talked about that in his own life in Romans chapter 7. He said this, the things that I want to do, I'm not doing them. And conversely, the things that I don't want to do as a follower of Christ, too often I find myself doing those things. And he testified about that battle that rages within. And any person, John says in 1 John 1 8, who says, I don't have any sin in my life, is kidding himself or herself. You're not fooling anybody else. Those around him, you still say, wait a minute, Pastor Dale, I'm tell you, I, I quit sinning. Hopefully the person beside you, hey, let me, let me help you sit down. You're embarrassing yourself. Those around can testify. But how can the person be so deceived? Because they've never viewed themselves in light of God's perfect holiness, which, as I said, if even remotely understood, would make us aware how far we've fallen short of God's standards. The self-righteous man, and I have people come into my office all the time, are oh, you going to have a mind? Yes, I think so, because I'm a good person. Really? You take the Lord's name remaining, you watch movies you shouldn't be watching, and you're doing all kinds of things, and you're not doing honest work, 
and you're doing all these things and you're running around with your spouse and you're doing all these things and young people you're just saying that you're a good person. Really? In whose eyes? Well, I'm comparing myself to everybody out there and I'm a lot better than them. And you know what? Some of them go to a church and I'm better than them too. That's a sad comment on the church. But that doesn't cut it. God's saying, God, you're all, we're all sinners. Look at the end of verse 8. If we say we're sinless, the truth is not in us. We have to confess that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And until unless we do that, we'll never see the need to be born again. No one can be saved until they know that they're lost. We want to verse 9. Contrary to the counterfeit Christian, the one who's truly saved regularly confesses his or her sin. They have the Holy Spirit living in them, convicting them, and showing them their sin. They're aware of their sin. They seek relief from the burden and guilt of sin by openly, honestly confessing it to God. In the light of Scripture and, and against the holiness of God, sin is exposed. You read the Bible and you go, wow, that's talking about me. That's talking about things that I do. That's talking about my thought life. That's talking about places I go. That's talking about things that I say. It's talking about me and it shows us. The Holy Spirit shows us. And the Christian can relate to what David said about unconfessed confess sin in his life. In Psalm 32, 3 and 4, he said, When I kept silent, my bones were all day long. Your hand was heavy upon me and I was sapped of energy in my life. You can come in here and walk in and out and I can think and everybody else can think, Wow, they're in love with Jesus. They got it all. And you can be living a wild life. And you can come in here smiling and nobody can figure it out. But inside, the Holy Spirit's gone. Don't cut it. You might fool everybody else, but you're not fooling God. And he's not going to give you peace and rest. That word confess means that we agree with God about our sin. We say, God, yes, I've violated your standards. I've missed the mark. I need your forgiveness and your cleansing. As a Christian, it's for fellowship. When you sin, it breaks the fellowship. It never breaks the relationship, but it breaks the fellowship with God. Just like your children, they disobey you. They don't stop being your child. They're still your child, but if they disobey you, Hopefully they come and say, I'm sorry I was wrong, and then that communication is opened up again. That's how it is with the child of God. When we sin, the communication, when we let the fellowship is broken to share it. We get it back and we go, God, I'm your child, but I've been acting like it. And I've been disobeying and I need you to forgive me. We can offer excuses and do that, but as if we're really a child of God, we take over to God. I didn't treat Sandy right. I, I said something unkind. I had an impure thought. I did that. I guess I didn't do that. It's a sin. God, I, I don't have any excuses. I'm not going to blame my wife. How many times have you You made me mad. Like the wife of your husband was twisting your arm going, get mad. Get mad. Like they twist, you couldn't help it. No, we're responsible for our own sin and we take ownership. Here's what uh, our world has a skewed view of sin. Here's what the world says. Man calls it an accident, God calls it an abomination. Man calls it a blunder, God calls it a disease. Man calls it a, a chance, God calls it a choice. Man calls it an error, God calls it empathy. Man calls it a fascination, God calls it fatality. Man calls it an infirmity, God calls it an iniquity. Man calls it a luxury, God calls it leprosy. Man calls it liberty, God says it's lawlessness. Man calls it a trifle, God calls it tragedy. Man says it's a mistake, but God calls it madness. Man says it's a weakness, but God calls it willfulness. Entrance into God's kingdom is marked by a confession of sin. When we say, God, I'm a sinner, and I'm spiritually bankrupt, and in and of myself, I have nothing to present to you. I need your mercy and your grace. That's when we begin the journey of salvation. And when we ask the Lord to forgive us and to cleanse us and to come into our life, we become children of God. We are then saved. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. To illustrate what we're talking about. In this temple, there were two people praying. There's the self-righteous Pharisee, the religious leader. He's saying, God, I thank you, but I'm not like anybody else in here. I thank you, I'm not like that low-life tax collector right over there beside me. Look at him. I'm not like that. I tithe and I do all these things and I even give above a tithe. I give more than 10%. And God, you must be pretty pleased with me. Thank you, God. And then there's the public and the tax collector who he didn't even look. He was aware of his own sin. He was so overwhelmed with the reality of his sin, the magnitude of his sin against God, 
that he said, God, he didn't even look to heaven. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he saw his true condition. He was a broken man. He understood that his only hope for salvation was to throw himself the mercy and grace of God. A holy God, but also a loving God. That kind of humble confession marks everyone who's truly justified. After the moment of salvation, the confession of sin continues throughout the remainder of our earthly life. Let's consider how Paul was continually aware of how he grew in his faith. He still was aware of his sin. He never forgot who he was. Who's, anybody watching AD? Talks about the Apostle Paul in there. He was Saul of Tarsus, persecuting Christians, actually having them executed. And he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, and his life was changed. Here's how he assessed himself beginning from his earliest letters to his latest. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he said, I am the least of all the apostles. Then he goes on and writes in Ephesians 3, I am not only the least of all the apostles, but I'm the least of all God's people. And then in 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says, here's the faithful saying, it's worthy of all acceptation, except the saying, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. I'm the worst of the sinners. As Paul matured in Christ, he grew in awareness of his own sin. That's the mark of someone that's truly saved. The difference between the true believer and the false professor is not whether or not they sin. Listen, we all sin. Saved and unsaved. We all sin. But when the genuine believer, the genuine Christian sin, he despises that sin. The counterfeit believer plunges into the sin and it seems to enjoy it. And there's no remorse. You watch people go, how can they be like that? How can they possibly be doing that, living like that, acting like it doesn't bother them? Because they don't know Jesus. They don't have the guilt, the shame. I want to read for you Proverbs 28, 13. It's a great verse for one that you do well to mark in your Bible and to remember Proverbs 28, 13, written by uh, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Here's what he said. He who conceals his sin does not prosper. You sin, you want to cover it, say, I'm not going to owe up my sin, I'm not going to acknowledge it. You don't prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces his sin finds mercy. The true believer confesses his sin. The pretender seeks to cover it. Now back to 1 John 1.10. One who claims to be a Christian but refuses to owe the personal sin to be concerned about their salvation. People can identify, easily identify, I see their sin, and I see their sin, and I see their sin. They can identify the sin of other people. They can even go out and protest about the ills and the sicknesses of society. But if they're blind to the wretchedness of their own sin, they're lost. And until we owe up to our sin, we don't have a sense of a need for forgiveness and for God's grace and mercy. If you're sitting there this morning going, well, Pastor, what do I need to be saved from? That's an indication. You still haven't seen your own sin yet. Don't understand its consequences. To insist, John says, that you have no sin is equivalent to calling God a liar. First John 1 10. Without apology, God makes it clear that every man, woman, young person is a sinner in need of salvation. So let me ask you, have you ever come clean before God? Have you ever humbly confessed your sin and sought his forgiveness? Some people, listen, they grieve over their sin because it's cost them dearly. It's cost them their marriage. It's cost them their family. It's cost them their job. It's cost them their health. But unless and until we understand as David did in Psalm 51, listen, ultimately all sin is against God. It's God that we grieve. Until we come to that point, we're not going to come to the Lord for reconciliation. But when we say, God, Yes, I've sinned against other people, but first and foremost, I've sinned against you, and I need your forgiveness. Judas is scary. That guy was filled with remorse. He went and he tried to return the money that he sold uh, Jesus out for. He said, we don't want it to blood money. Then he went out and he hung himself. He wasn't sorry for the right reason. We should be broken over our sin because it grieves a holy, a loving God who made us who gave his son Jesus Christ for us. It was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. Do you agree that it was your sin, my sin that put Jesus on the cross? Let me ask you, 
Does that bother you that you're sitting with Jesus on the cross? Does it bother you? Enough that you're willing to confess it, to tell God you're sorry, and you're going to repent of your sin, and you seek His forgiveness, His cleansing. As the beloved him asks, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed with the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting His grace desire? Are you washed with the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed with the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed with the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed with the blood of the Lamb. Was the fountain flowing for the soul unclean? Or be washed with the blood? Let's quickly move on to chapter 2, the first two verses. Even though believers continue to sin, God provides a means by which His anger toward our sin may be appeased. Listen to me. If you look at the first verse there in chapter 2, John says, I write to you so that you do not sin. If you truly are saved, you shouldn't have yet, well, God saved me, covered me by the blood of by the blood of His Son, His grace and mercy is what it's all about. I'm just going to keep going out there and sinning. You don't understand salvation and what Jesus did for you. Paul addressed that. He said, what if we're, if we're saved by grace and we just go out and sin more so that God's grace just keeps God? He said, God forbid you think that way. So John says, I write to you so that you do not sin. But the reality is you do sin. And if you sin, you have an advocate, a defense attorney. Why do we need a defense attorney? Because... Revelation 12, 10 says the accuser of the brother, that's Satan. He's going and he's saying, see, hey God, see Dave speaks? God is your child. See how he just acted? Hear what he just said? Know where he just went? Know what he just watched? Know what he was listening to? I thought he's your child. Jesus is our defense attorney, 1 John 2, 2. We have a defense attorney. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is saying, Father, my blood Pay for their sin. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The fact is this, as long as we have breath in a sound mind, we're going to continue to sin even after our salvation. That's the bad news, but the good news is through it all, Jesus Christ remains our advocate. He died for us, and He serves us to pacify God's wrath toward our sin. A genuine believer will practice a lifestyle of confessing his sin and seeking God's forgiveness. And he'll receive God's full acquittal through the blood of Jesus. So, how are you by yourselves? Have you passed the second test? The person who's truly saved, the one is the one who, having seen the light of God's holiness, senses his own wickedness. And he confesses his sin before God. And he seeks God's forgiveness on the basis of what Jesus did for him. Does that describe you? Pretender. A counterfeit Christian, and I'm afraid that there are people in churches that are the pretenders of counterfeit Christians. They go on in their own sinful way, and they have no regard whatsoever for their sin. It doesn't bother. They can spew out profanity. They can do all kinds of things that they were doing before their supposed profession of Christ. They're no different in the world's watch from what? I don't care that you go to church every week. Apparently, it hasn't done anything for you. You're still working the same way. You're still gossiping about people. You're still watching the same stuff. You're still acting the exact same way. It means nothing to me. The sincere believer gets the fact that he's still a sinner. He's a work in progress. Do you agree today that your sin has fallen woefully short of God's holiness? Do you understand that your sin has separated you from God? Do you sense a need for God's forgiveness and cleansing? Have you confessed that you're a sinner before God? and told God, I'm willing to turn to you from my sin. Are you walking in the light of God's holiness as your lifestyle? Do you understand that Jesus Christ is the only provision for your sin? And have you put your faith in Jesus alone for salvation? If you can answer yes, then you should have assurance of your salvation. But if you say, wow, some of those questions, no, I'm not sure. I haven't come clean before God. I've never done that. I've never heard of I've never invited Jesus. I've never told him that I'm sorry. Maybe there's a reason for your uncertainty. Maybe there are some here today who still need to deal with your relationship with God, your sin against Him. If that's where you are, I pray you come to Him today. He'll never turn you away. John 6, 37, Jesus said, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. Don't worry about, what will anybody else in the church think about me? I've been going to church for a long time, but they didn't think about me. All those weeks, all those times I was there, and I wasn't saved when they don't worry about them. Don't allow pride to keep you from coming to Christ for salvation. 
I am meeting with people when I tell them, listen, I have someone tell me, you know what? It would be hard for me to go to church right now. Knowing what I've done to who I am. And I flat out said, listen, I get you. But you know what? Anybody that knows me knows I'm about grace and mercy. And so is God. And if you walk into this church and somebody looks at you and goes, what are you doing in here? And gives you that impression. Just let me know. I'll take you to my office and have a good conversation. Because God's all about grace and mercy. So don't worry about what other people think. Don't let that keep you out of heaven. After you've lived your life and come to the end, what then? Because Jesus asked, what good is it for a man if he gained the whole world and yet he forfeit his soul? The point is this. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have everything that you need. But if you die without Jesus Christ, you have absolutely nothing. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to ask you, are you sure of your salvation? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you can say, yes, I know Jesus. I've asked him to forgive me. I've invited him to be my Savior. He lives in me. I know I've eternal life. And thank God for that assurance because not everybody has it. But if you're here and you're honest, I, I hear you talking about a personal relationship. I'm not sure I have it. I'm sure I don't have that. I want that. And I encourage you to pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own life. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm agreeing with your word. Yes, I am a sinner. And I understand that I'm spiritually dead because of that sin. But Jesus, I also am aware that you went to the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, you took my sin out of your body. And you shed your blood and you gave your life to pay for my sin. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. Would you please forgive me that you cleanse me? And Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life as my Savior. And I'm also aware that you not only want to be the Savior, you want to be the Lord, the Master, the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me today. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you pray that prayer today, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm going to point you out in any fashion whatsoever. You say, Pastor, I pray. Yes, I'm going to have to just have to pray that prayer. Yes, I'm going to pray. Yes. Perhaps there are those who say, I'm a child of God, but my walk has gone a little bit cool. I'm going to go home this week. I'm giving God permission to search my life and to show me where I've gone astray. Whether it be sins of omission, things that I should have done that I haven't, or things of commission, things that I've done that I shouldn't. I'm going to go home, let the Spirit of God search me and show me. And I, I want to deal with this so that I can have the fellowship back, the sharing, the interaction that I had one time. I, I've strayed in my passion for the Lord's God. Would you pray for me, Pastor? I might do that. Yes, or no. Father, Thank you for loving us. Thank you that you want us to know of our eternal life. You don't want us to doubt it. It's a no so reality. Lord, I thank you for those today that have prayed and given their lives to Jesus Christ. And I pray that they would understand that it's Jesus who saved them and it's Jesus who keeps them safe. And now he wants them to grow in their walk with Jesus. He wants to change them, to become more like himself. Lord, I pray that you dismiss us with your blessing. I pray for Bible school this week. I pray for Karina. And I pray, Lord, for this body of believers as we go out into the mission field, Lord, that we represent you in a way that brings you honor, Lord.